All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you for the, the kind introduction. Um, it's uh, a very interesting symposium, I think, in terms of trying to think about this uh, intersection between cancer and neurodegeneration. Uh, my lab does a lot of work on both. So we do a lot of work in cancer. We do a lot of work on uh, neurodegeneration. We don't do a lot of work at the interface between the two. So this was sort of a, uh, an impetus to think about that uh, a little bit more uh, than we usually do. Uh, so I'll start with the obligatory disclosures. Um, I am a co-founder of a company called Aravail, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about the project that led to that today. So in interest of disclosure, they did uh, help fund uh, that project, and then I'm involved with a few different pharmas and centers and such. Uh, that doesn't relate too much to today. So in cancer and neurodegeneration, of course, it's the whole point uh, of today's meeting. There's a lot of uh, overlapping interests. I thought, um, you know, we've got great uh, insights into this from the early speakers. I really loved the uh, diagram that Jane showed that really had, you know, all the commonalities and then the things that are opposing as we think about cancer and neurodegeneration. I'm going to go through a number of those um, as we go through uh, the talk today. Uh, there is an interesting metabolic basis to this. There seems to be uh, a lot uh, that is related in terms of overlapping genes. I'll go through a number of those uh, and we'll go from there. I also wanted to just say a couple words about uh, just the brain in general because I think uh, you know, we're focusing on neurodegeneration and then of course there's brain cancer and all the other kinds of cancers. Uh, the brain really is a fan, uh, fantastically interesting frontier and especially being here inside the Allen Institutes where you've got uh, the Brain Institute which has been so in, uh, influential, the Cell Biology Institute that obviously is putting forth all these cell types in the brain as well. Uh, coupled with the artificial intelligence that's trying to recreate the ability to make a brain makes this, I, I think, really just one of the singular uh, institutes in the world. And I, and I think that this whole focus around neurodegeneration and cancer and that interface uh, is really uh, helped by all those other kinds of uh, emerging elements here as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of uh, one of my major projects, kind of my major effort here just for a little bit to give you a sense for um, where I'm coming from and what we're really doing. And almost everything I'm going to talk about today will be uh, work from um, our lab in, in one way or another. And I just want to give a bit of a background uh, and then bring it back to uh, implications for cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, I work in a field um, where we're trying to think a lot about what really drives health uh, for individuals. Uh, and if you take this, this is taken from a 2007 New England Journal of Medicine paper. But if you look at the determinants of health in the United States and what really drives health over the span of your life, it turns out that about 30% uh, of your lifetime health is attributable back in one way or another to the, your genetics, the hand you've been dealt. About 60% is attributable back to behavior and lifestyle. And we heard a lot about that uh, in the earlier talks, especially I would say in, in Jane's talk about uh, some of the metabolic um, lifestyle factors that in, both the uh, likelihood of neurodegeneration as well as the likelihood of cancer. And it turns out that only about 10% of a person's lifetime health is attributable back directly to the healthcare system. So that's a really strong reason to focus uh, more on that 90% than what we do on the 10% today. So um, if you think about that 10%, we currently spend $4 trillion a year nearly in the United States on healthcare. Uh, and by the way, from a uh, National Academy uh, uh, of Medicine a report from a few years ago, estimated that 97% of those costs are spent on care after illness. So one of the other things that I'll argue for a little bit here as well, and I think is uh, uh, alignment with some of the earlier talks, is a need to focus on those earliest stages of what's driving the generation of cancers and the generation of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, conversely, we have a wellness industry that is focused on prevention. Um, I'm wearing my Fitbit like a, a lot of people here and so forth. Uh, and there has been, but the wellness industry today, I would say, is a pretty mixed bag. There's a ton of it that's really fantastic, and there's a lot of it that doesn't have much of a scientific basis. And so this has led us to really uh, push for what we call scientific wellness. And I'm going to talk about that just for a moment. Uh, and basically, the notion of scientific wellness is to try to be very proactive in the course of disease, trying to optimize health, minimize the chance of transitioning to disease, reversing it as its early stages, rather than waiting for uh, catastrophic failure like we get in the late stages of Alzheimer's or cancer. Uh, the desire to um, get into this area led Lee Hood and I to announce a project in 2014 
uh, which we called the 100K Wellness Project. So this is an aspirational project where we said we're going to recruit uh, 100,000 individuals, do whole genome sequencing on everybody, and then multiple times per year measure proteomes, metabolomes, clinical chemistries, microbiomes, uh, wearable devices, and so forth uh, to generate um, what we call dense, dynamic, personal data clouds. The idea of this being that we can generate a huge amount of information that's dense enough in terms of how much we have, uh, dynamic in the sense that we can get it uh, over a long period of time and, and at uh, good regular intervals so that we can look for the early warning signs for diseases like cancer and neurodegenerative disease. Uh, one of the things that I'll argue is that we often don't study what we most want to know uh, in science. I'll use myself as the example. Uh, so I have a grant from the uh, NIH. It's on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's with the Accelerating Medicine um, Program uh, for Alzheimer's, AMP-AD. Uh, but basically, uh, we study the brains of people who have Alzheimer's and those who don't. But when do we do that? After they're dead, right? Nobody is going to give you a piece of their brain before then. And so um, basically, that's not what we really want to know. What we really want to understand is what was happening in the body of the person that got Alzheimer's disease or the person that got cancer 20 years before uh, that wasn't happening in the body of the person that didn't get Alzheimer's. And what we really, really want to know is uh, if we had known what that difference was, could we have altered it? Could we have changed that trajectory? So that's the notion here. Uh, and this project is basically taking uh, two different forms. Uh, the first is, as I mentioned, this company, uh, Aravail, that uh, Lee Hood and I co-founded along with Clayton Lewis, who's our CEO. Uh, and basically, uh, this is a consumer-facing company. The nice thing about it is that if people come in through Aravail, if they check a box saying that their data can be used anonymously for research, all that data now comes back into ISB. So this has been the way that we've financed this project. If you did a little math in your head for the 100K project, it's about a $10 billion proposition. Uh, so this is the way that we're um, making that happen. Uh, we've got about 5,000 individuals who are signed up so far. Uh, we've raised uh, just under $39 million to get, uh, or I'm sorry, just under $40 million to get the um, uh, company off the ground. We've got 170 people working there now. Uh, and in essence, people come in, different financing models since they uh, pay for the assays. Uh, but basically, the, the genesis of that is that you focus on scientific wellness, which is this immediate give back of information that has an impact for people's health in the moment so that they then contribute that data back so you can learn over the long haul and give them back insights into the early stages of cancer, the early stages of neurodegenerative disease. So it fills in a lot of that information that we don't get very often because we don't get super detailed measurements until someone signs up for a clinical trial or until they are um, sick. Uh, so that's um, how that's um, going forward. Uh, on the other side, uh, ISB, if you're not a f uh, familiar with us, ISB is a nonprofit research institute founded by Lee Hood in 2000. Uh, it's been standalone for most of its life, uh, but this year, uh, or early uh, last year, I should say now, or in 2017, but in 2016, uh, we affiliated with Providence, which is the third largest nonprofit healthcare system in the country. So it's 50 hospital system in the Western United States. Uh, Lee Hood's become the, the chief science officer for the whole of the Providence system. Uh, we have a new incoming president now to ISB, uh, which is Jim Heath coming up from Caltech. Uh, but basically what this uh, interface with Providence does is that it lets us action on things that we can identify from these dense dynamic data clouds, launch clinical trials, uh, do uh, research of various kinds, and I'm going to tell you about a few of those studies uh, in a moment um, that are actually both focused on Alzheimer's and cancer. So uh, in the Pioneer 100, uh, we looked at um, whole genome sequencing, so that gives you millions of differences in every individual. Uh, and by the way, this Pioneer 100 project, I'm trying to do a very abbreviated version of this, um, basically was uh, the, the, the pilot for the 100K Wellness Project. And so we just recruited people, mostly here from uh, Seattle area, the community, a few from other places, um, some of whom you would know. Um, won't get into that at the moment. Uh, so anyway, we did, 100, we did whole genome sequencing on everybody. We did the labs that I mentioned. So this was 150 clinical labs, 700 metabolites, 400 proteins, uh, gut microbiome. Uh, these are all done three times during the year. Uh, as I mentioned before, and continual tracking. This gives us what we call um, our dense dynamic personal data clouds, and that's a database of actionable possibilities that grows over time. Okay, and I'll give you just a couple ideas from there. So one thing we can do is we can find uh, new correlations across these data. 
And uh, this is just a diagram that shows uh, correlations that are statistically significant after uh, multiple hypothesis correction that cross different um, labs. And, and the one area down here, and I'm going to go into this in detail, uh, you'll see the, do anything? Um, so if you look at this uh, genetic traits at the bottom, there's only 108 individuals, so we're not looking at um, you know, um, uh, variants or anything like that with that sample size. But we can map to genetic traits. And I'm going to bring that up because what those traits are in general are disease risk. So you can take your disease risk for Alzheimer's disease or your disease risk for cancer, and then you can see what are all the other elements that are correlated with that disease risk and start to have an understanding of how disease risk manifests in the body. And I'm going to give you one example, um, actually not taken in this case from cancer or Alzheimer's. It's the one uh, that's coming out of our paper. We have a, a paper on this that's coming out in Nature Biotech here pretty soon. Um, but I will talk about one disease just to give you the concept, and then I want to relate that back to cancer and neurodegeneration, which will be the rest of the talk. So in one case here, uh, we have a relationship. So these are just uh, modules that we pull out in an unbiased way from the big network. Uh, I have some videos of how that happens, but I took them out. <laughs> Especially after the first speaker, I don't want to be out videoed by my crappy video compared to <laughs> uh, the uh, amazing videos from, the, uh, from uh, Laszlo Barabasi. Anyway, but we have the uh, uh, cysteine, uh, and you'll see it's connected there to uh, inflammatory bowel disease, if you see that right there. And so the interesting thing there is that inflammatory bowel disease in that case, it's not, it doesn't mean the disease. What that is, what's that a label for is for the genetic risk for disease. So one really interesting thing that we learned when we first proposed doing the 100,000 uh, person wellness project, or we thought of that number of 100,000, 100, um, and in talking about that, I should say Gustavo Glusman here in the, in the uh, room did a, a huge amount of work for this as well. Um, but basically, uh, when we thought about that 100,000, we were thinking about you know, people kind of cascading down, and then you see a disease trajectory, right? And getting back to what's the trajectory into Alzheimer's, what's the trajectory into cancer, and so forth. Uh, and you need sort of a big number so that the number at the bottom, you have enough to learn something from. But in, in switching the paradigm here a little bit, what we found is that if you think about genetic risk, if you've got good GWAS mapping and GWAS variants, now uh, every single person is relevant to the study of every single disease. Not everyone has a disease. Everyone has a genetic risk, whether it be high, low, medium, whatever it is. And so there's a lot you can learn from that. So one example that we did very early, um, and I just want to show the concept here. So we found that there was a strong negative correlation uh, between, this isn't working at all, yeah, a little bit, uh, between um, inflammatory bowel disease genetic risk and the amount of cysteine that's in a person's plasma. So the interesting element of that, and you'll see that's very significant even after multiple hypothesis correction, so 10 to the minus 6 even after, after you correct. Uh, but then we go into the literature, and it turns out there's a couple interesting things. One is that uh, plasma cysteine has been found to be uh, one of the top candidate biomarkers out of the blood for IBD as the disease itself. And the second element is that ulcerative colitis, which is a form of IBD, turns out the lower your uh, cysteine is, uh, cysteine is a dimer form of cysteine, basically uh, the worse your disease is. And so what was interesting that, there's just two facts, uh, two, uh, two implications there that I think are quite interesting. So one is that you can actually disambiguate what's related to the genetic risk for the disease from what's related to the disease having um, started or the onset of the disease. Because remember, we find this relationship with cysteine in people who range in age from 20s to 80s uh, and um, uh, the range, uh, range in age from 20s to 80s in which nobody has the disease. So that's one. That means you can do a correction factor for any, basically any case control study in the world because this gives you the background that's related to the risk of the disease rather than the onset. Uh, the second major point is that you can think about pathways to prevention. So in this case, there's actually a pretty interesting um, hypothesis that comes up. So you have these genes that genetic risk manifests as this lower cysteine. Turns out there are other papers that show that uh, suppressed cysteine uh, which sits upstream of glutathione, uh, means that you're less well able to deal with oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is a trigger for IBD, so it suggests something immediately, which is that you're at high genetic risk for uh, IBD. Uh, if it's mediated through this, though, you could imagine a very simple sort of nutritional type, you know, metabolic intervention that would change you from being at high genetic risk 
to being at low risk for that disease. So you can swap yourself. So I just wanted to bring up that concept br briefly because that's a concept that we'd love to get into in a lot more detail around all the genetics that are known about Alzheimer's and all that are known as cancer. In fact, we have ongoing studies to do that, but we haven't quite taken them as far as with IBD quite yet. Um, but basically, uh, what you can do then is to start mapping for all those genetic maps that you saw earlier, right? If here's your, um, your very high, high risk but low penetrance genes to your you know, high penetrance um, um, low risk uh, uh, dis, uh, genes. For all of those, you can start doing a mapping uh, from those genetic risks onto how does that manifest into the body? What are the kind of things that are altered in the blood? And then uh, by mapping that into networks, you can figure out pathways to, is there a way to intervene to make a difference in how that genetic risk seems to be manifesting? Okay, so I just wanted to, to put forth that concept because I think that's going to be really an important factor. Uh, I also want to say, obviously, we're trying to track P, uh, individuals at early disease. And I'm going to give a couple uh, very small N, uh, N of 1 uh, examples that just come out of this first year of monitoring. Uh, so in one person, uh, this is a pioneer. This is someone who's coming through Aravale. Uh, he was diagnosed with, um, or I'm sorry, was not diagnosed. He was coming in. And basically, we had blood draws for him. And what we noticed was, um, in essence, uh, he had really high, if you look at his leukocyte level, so that's just a histogram of the leukocyte levels that are measured from every blood draw from every person that's come through our program up to this point in time. And what you can see here is that um, this person uh, here, July 2015, we saw they were a very big outlier. Uh, November, we saw it again. So you can see this repeated you know, big outlier. So we referred them back to their physician uh, to go get that checked out. Uh, and in fact, what happened, you can see how elevated this is, uh, was that they were, in fact, diagnosed with leukemia. So this was a person that had leukemia, didn't know about it. And so we were able to go back and, uh, anyway, just trigger that so that they knew about it, get it treated uh, before it became uh, a more major problem. Another interesting thing is if you go back into the proteomics data, so here's a particular protein. Um, and again, this is everyone in the data set. Uh, and here's the pioneer with leukemia. So you can just see major outlier. Uh, so potential, uh, this, is, uh, this is a protein that's involved in the stimulation of uh, B and T cells. Uh, and so basically, this is something that would be, we now have uh, marked to, to, to follow to see if this translates to something that might be a good um, marker and things like that. Uh, OK, and I'll talk a little bit about that, debating with myself whether or not to regress. And we actually think that the way that biomarkers are done should be radically altered. I'm trying to decide if I want to get into that too much. I'll, I'll say a, a few words about that in a moment. Um, one of the things is, uh, and then here's another person. So this is a woman in her 50s, uh, in this case, pancreatic cancer. Uh, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in January. Bert Vogelstein and others have. Um, um, argued that it, when you're diagnosed, on average, it means you've had that disease for five years. We went back in her blood. Uh, she'd been in our program, in this case, for 18 months. So we could go back to that old blood draw. Here's another protein. You can see here's the distribution for everybody. And here is, the, uh, is her. So she's, again, major outlier in this protein. It, this is a protein in the notch signaling pathway. Uh, it is expressed in the pancreas. Uh, it's related to pancreatic cancer and so forth. And so there's some interesting elements here. So one of the things that we're really interested in then, obviously, is monitoring people and trying to understand early warning signs for disease. And we talked about pathways, so pathways both to Alzheimer's, pathways to cancers, and so forth. And basically, uh, you know, in terms of how biomarkers are done, it's one thing to see this sort of in retrospect. Right? It's a very different thing to say, OK, I see this signal. So this, the next person I see high on this protein, are they, in fact, getting pancreatic cancer or not? Right? So that's one way, and we're going to be following that to see uh, you know, how true that is. And as this really ramps up big, uh, we're going to ha we have already automated systems that are being built to monitor all of this uh, in real time. So the other thing, uh, though, that's really fascinating is uh, to not think so much about um, biomarkers for a disease, but actually to think about divergence from wellness. And what I mean by that is what we're working on right now is essentially having wellness states that are very well defined. And then as you observe these outliers, essentially, or divergence away from wellness, you can then do an analysis of all of the things that are divergent 
and then try to do a mapping of that back to a disease or a different process or something like that. So that's different than saying that this protein is always what's going to be the signal. The idea, though, is that if you're developing a disease, you're going to perturb something away from, norm from normality. You should do an analysis on all of those things that are divergent. And if you've got these dense dynamic data clouds, you can then um, analyze all those things that are divergent. Where do they seem to originate from? Where do they seem to come from? It moves you away from having to think about something as being the biomarker for X uh, into basically an analysis on the set of things that are divergent. So this is really where we're going on that. Um, and I want to move forward in the interest of time here. So uh, we are doing a number of projects related to what I just showed. We're uh, launching a clinical trial. Jared Roach, who's here in the audience as well, is really uh, driving this. Uh, along with uh, a number of our collaborators, uh, Dale Bredesen at uh, UCLA being one of them, uh, who has uh, uh, very much in line with you know, what, was, uh, what uh, Jane talked about earlier on kind of metabolic bases for Alzheimer's, has developed a very holistic type of program that's based on shifting uh, metabolism in different ways, exercise, brain training, hormones, drug, very comprehensive approach. But he now has 120 case studies where he claims the ability to have reversed early stage Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we're going to test that now in a prospective uh, clinical trial. Providence just committed $10 million to this trial uh, to really get us going uh, on it. So we're um, excited about that. We could talk a lot more about that. We're also driving uh, uh, a scientific wellness program for cancer survivors. Uh, it turns out this is being done with Swedish um, uh, Cancer Institute here in town led by Tom Brown. Uh, but in this case, we're looking at people who have gone through have actually survived cancer, but uh, have a lot of negative consequences due to chemotherapy and things of that nature. A lot of that actually comes back to their brain as well. They, they talk about brain fog or memory loss and all these kind of elements. And so we're going to do a deep dive on that. And then another uh, that we're launching of these uh, what we call translational pillar projects around scientific wellness is that Providence has actually now put 2,000 of their own employees through the Aravail program. That's going to give us all these dense dynamic data clouds. We're going to do an analysis of how that is deployed within the healthcare system and then an economic analysis of how that affects the prevalence of Alzheimer's, of cancer, and all these other uh, kinds of diseases. Another just interesting uh, note on that front is that Washington State University just launched a new medical school. It's going to start this fall. They're putting every single one of their first year medical students through uh, Aravel through the scientific wellness program, and then it's going to get integrated into the curricula. Uh, of what they're doing. And, and Lee and I and Ilya Shmulevich and Sui Wong at ISB are just about finished on a textbook on systems biology and systems medicine uh, that's going to be utilized uh, in that context as well. OK, so that's just a little bit of context around how we can use genetic, how we can do longitudinal mapping to understand the early signs of cancer and Alzheimer's, and also how we can use genetic risk via dense dynamic data clouds to understand uh, what might be warning signs uh, in advance. Okay. I'm going to shift now um, away from that into uh, some of the other work that we're doing. So uh, we can look certainly for molecular diagnostics, early disease perturbations. Um, here's uh, one that's quite interesting. This was done by Jocelyn Pearl, who's here in the uh, 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 auditorium as well. Uh, Jocelyn's a grad student who is uh, graduating this year. She's fantastic. So if, you're, if you need someone, if you're uh, you should try to compete for her. She's great. But <laughs> anyway, she is, uh, she's done a lot of work here, along with Seth Ahmet, um, who was a postdoc in the group, who's now a professor out at the University of Maryland. Uh, but in this case, this was a, an interesting study in mice. This is in Huntington's disease. Uh, and these were transcriptomes. So we did about 800 different transcriptomes during the very earliest stages in the mice. So this is four weeks to 20 weeks. So this is way before there's any symptoms, just to see if there was any kind of change that came. And one of the interesting things, and the idea here is trying to look at that earliest disease transition, just like what we're doing with the, um, uh, with the scientific wellness cohorts. And what you can see here is there's uh, a few things that came out that were quite interesting. So here, this is a gene called PANK. Uh, and what you can see is that it's essentially not differentiated early on, but around, I don't know, the 10th week or the 12th week or so, we start to see a pretty strong divergence uh, between uh, the mice that have the extended CAG repeats that leads to Huntington's. Um, was discussed in the last talk, uh, as well as um, uh, compared to controls. And you can see that hold true for both black six mice and, uh, to a lesser extent, in CD1. Uh, but the idea here is just basically being able to use the dynamics, in this case in mice, and in humans we can do these dynamics via the blood to see those, those earliest uh, changes. 
Uh, I think I'll skip this really quick in the interest of time. This is only just to show for many different pathways. Basically, you just see that it's going from white to darker blue, basically, as you go forward in time. That's just showing that even early on, way before symptoms, we're starting to see more and more networks being hit by differences between having that extended CAG repeat uh, in the HTT gene and not. And that's essentially driving all of that. If we shift back to cancer, uh, this is a paper that just came out, I think, uh, this month or last month uh, in cell systems that we did joint with Lee Hood's group and Charles Cobbs at the uh, Swedish Cancer Institute here in town. Uh, but basically here, uh, what we did was to look for markers of glioblastoma, and so, uh, which is brain cancer. And so here, uh, we followed a uh, trajectory, and I won't go through all of this, but basically we did discovery proteomics, uh, identified a set of proteins that were uh, matched to the surface of uh, the cell. Uh, so this is a cell surface specific or cell membrane uh, specific uh, signature. Identified 33 proteins that seem to be uh, enriched uh, along the sur uh, in cell surface proteins for GBM. And then it turned out that if when we looked into it further, we were actually able to find four of those that secreted into the blood very nicely and gave us uh, very high accuracy uh, in terms of being able to differentiate blood that came from glioblastoma patients from normal controls. Um, I don't want, you know, I, I'm careful to not say that's, you know, it's not a biomarker yet or anything like that. There's a lot of specificity that needs to go through before, uh, before we'd get there. But what's quite interesting that, uh, you know, but through this sort of very principled mass spec approach of identifying what's on the surface, what's very differential on the surface from GBM and not, uh, we got very good, um, validation there. Uh, the other element that we did is we used these four proteins in a more specific scenario in 10 patients, so small n, but uh, this was just kind of the tail end of the paper after review. Uh, but basically, we got uh, 10 additional patients where we were looking at recurrence. And so once the people were treated with GBM as they watched uh, as their tumor recurred, uh, these proteins were also useful for, uh, appear to be useful for monitoring um, that uh, recurrence. Uh, potential connections with neurodegeneration, because that's obviously the point of, of today's uh, talk. Uh, and this is interesting. So these are, don't represent any, you know, super deep analysis on my part. This is, you know, this is me literature searching. But just to show a lot of connections. Um, so uh, HMOX, which is one of these, turns out that that is related to uh, A-beta mediated hypomethylation. Uh, and it correlates also with cognitive impairment in, in um, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. CD44 uh, turned out, uh, you know, very simple uh, literature search. Uh, it's expressed in non-myelinating Schwann cells, and it could play a role in neurodegeneration-induced uh, glial plasticity. There was another one. Uh, VCAM1 uh, there at the bottom. Uh, so this was just a quote taken directly from the paper. Endothelial activation, especially VCAM1, was of clinical significance in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that reflected macro and microstructural changes, poor short-term memory, et cetera. So uh, I bring those up just in the sense that there's so many networks in common. And I think we're all also familiar with the fact that you know, every gene seems to be linked to every disease in some form or another. So you know, I wouldn't read too terribly much into this, other than to say it's clearly not just distinct players. There are a set of networks, uh, and you know, it was discussed uh, earlier today in terms of uh, trade-offs. And it's really true. There are many different trade-offs that every cell, every system in the body needs to make. And falling on one side or the other, you get into different disease scenarios. So it's not surprising that we see the same kinds of systems implicated over and over again in multiple different diseases. Um, anyway, so just a little bit about diagnostics. OK, so now I'm going to shift gears uh, again. Uh, I know this is a little bit like ping-ponging between Alzheimer, you know, neurodegeneration and, um, and cancer. Uh, which is uh, kind of what we, we've done in the lab. Now I'm going to ping pong a little bit even further. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about honeybees. So, <laughs> so basically, um, this was a study we did a little while ago. And it turns out that this uh, is, in some ways, maybe uh, the most centrally relevant to uh, the intersection of cancer and neurodegeneration that we've done. So this was work uh, that uh, we did in, uh, we published this in uh, 2011. Uh, the reason that I'm going to say a little bit about honeybees is that they are a, a really a key model system for the genomics of social behavior. 
And I got into this when I, uh, back in the days when I used to be a professor at the University of, of Illinois in Urbana. And I worked uh, with a fellow there, uh, Gene Robinson, who was the director of the Institute for Genomic Biology, fantastic scientist, a uh, great guy. Uh, but basically, he um, had uh, done a lot of work on different behaviors in honeybee and their relation back to um, transcriptomics. So he calls these neurogenomic states. And it turns out that there's a pretty strong uh, neurogenomic state that's related to a lot of these behaviors. And uh, he came to me at the end of this uh, NSF uh, grant that they had, and he said, you know, want to see if I want to do some systems analysis of this data. And he said they've done 20 experiments. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of a start for systems biology. He's like, that's 2,000 transcriptomes across, you know, 20 different <laughs> um, massive studies, it turned out. And so I was like, okay, that, uh, that sounds good. So without going into the details, we built a transcriptional regulatory network out of those data. And basically, uh, what we were able to do is to build a model, a predictive model, uh, that could predict expression of genes in new scenarios, um, which I won't go into here. Uh, we mapped that uh, via you know, inter integrating statistical and mechanistic networks. So basically, we mapped that onto a metabolic network. And one of the things that came out to be quite uh, interesting there is that uh, we found that there was a metabolic shift in highly aggressive um, bees, so bees that are really likely to sting you. And it turns out that they run, essentially, aerobic glycolysis. Uh, and this was really interesting because uh, this had not been observed, I don't think, before we published this in Genes, Brains, and Behavior in 2015. Uh, but basically, uh, this was a, sh a metabolic shift uh, underlying a, a persistent um, uh, mental state, essentially, of aggression. And the interesting thing about that, of course, is that aerobic glycolysis is, in essence, in cancer, what's known as the Warburg effect, right? And you're seeing this uh, great slide from uh, <laughs> van der Heiden again. Um, but basically, uh, this is, um, is very re relevant to that. So what it said is that there are all these normal behaviors uh, that are underpinned by similar um, metabolic um, uh, differences as what we see often in cancer. And shifting then, uh, this is a, um, from this a nice uh, imaging study here that shows where aerobic glycolysis uh, appears in the normal human brain. And what's really interesting is that there's two connections to Alzheimer's disease here as well. So there's a decrease in total glucose consumption in the brain, uh, including pre-onset. And this distribution of aerobic glycolysis in uh, normal uh, adults, it correlates spatially with where uh, uh, A beta deposition it occurs in Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, and so what was really fascinating about that then is that there seems to be then this connection between this shift into aerobic glycolysis and this amyloid deposition. It also relates very much to what we've been doing in the context of the Alzheimer's pillar uh, project that I talked to you about before, where the physicians that are working there really try to get the um, people to get into a ketogenic state. Uh, basically to try to shift away from some of these kind of metabolisms to try to have an effect on uh, A-beta and other, other pathways. Okay, uh, I heard the bell, so I know I don't have too much uh, longer to go, so um, I will apologize to the people whose work I'm about to zip through very fast. <laughs> Uh, but basically what we're doing, so I mentioned we built transcriptional regulatory networks for honeybees. We now have a much better, uh, more advanced way to do that, of course, because uh, the world moves forward. Uh, but we have been building out an, an, uh, an approach we call transcriptional regulatory network analysis, or TRINA. Uh, so this uh, basically leverages all the wonderful work that's been done by ENCODE and leverages all the big um, data resources that NIH has enabled, but essentially lets us build out transcriptional regulatory networks that use DNA uh, hypersensitivity uh, to find uh, open chromatin regions, to identify footprints, uh, to look for motifs within those footprints and so forth. Uh, but essentially, without going into all the details in the interest of time, uh, what this is letting us do now is to build out uh, for, for all the different genes that we've got, potential activators and repressors um, for all of them. Uh, you know, and those are, of course, putative. Uh, you go through a huge scale, uh, scale down here in terms of the number of motifs you find in the genome, which is 2.3 million and then filtering it down through many, many steps where you need multiple levels of evidence till you get down to a small number of targets for any particular uh, disease. Uh, but basically what I wanted to say is just that 
Uh, we're now, uh, we've built a big pipeline as part of our Big Data to Knowledge Center and working with great collaborators, uh, Ravi Maduri and others at the University of Chicago. We now are near finalizing a pipeline that allows these to be done at high throughput, uh, which has required actually a lot of uh, computational effort. Uh, and so now we, and then we will release to the public later this year a mapping of all these different networks for uh, all these different 26 uh, different uh, brain regions as well as other places in the body. So there's, there's a lot of things that we can dive through there. So just, uh, and that would be, I think, a nice resource for the study of both brain cancers as well as uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, we did one of these type models for Huntington's disease, and this will be my uh, last point. Uh, we identify a number of transcription factors uh, that are um, affected them and their downstream modules. This work that was done by uh, Jocelyn Pearl. Trina, I should say, was been done mostly by Corey Funk, who's uh, here, uh, as well as others. Uh, the downstream um, um, regulons uh, have also been affected. So I should say, for one of these, we moved forward for validation for a number of reasons, it being a really a top hit, as well as having really good antibody. Uh, when we look at that, uh, we're able to uh, identify all these modules that are uh, differentially expressed by the intersection with this SMAD3 gene uh, that comes out as a key regulator in Huntington's disease. And again, you know, just to be in the interest of this talk, when we validate this um, SMAD3 via uh, ChIP-seq and we find that the model uh, predicts accurately uh, its effects in Huntington's, uh, and again, we do the, the simple literature search and you find SMAD3 also implicated in TGF beta signaling during carcinogenesis. So, you know, basically you can, you can always find these kind of things, um, but there are a lot of interesting avenues, I think, to go down. All right, so just to come back then uh, full circle, uh, we talked a lot, especially at the beginning, about this notion of dense dynamic personal data clouds, uh, being able to dive in, understand that data using de network analyses of different uh, types. Uh, this is really the basis, uh, we would say, for personalized medicine. Uh, for cancer and neurodegeneration. So to conclude, um, number of points. Uh, so cancer and neurodegenerative diseases uh, both been extensively studied. Uh, there's still a long way to go on each of them individually. The interface, I think, not very much. Uh, um, not very many people. We've heard uh, you know, a couple talks to, uh, today that have really done that. Um, but uh, we haven't done that a lot in the past. Uh, I think that as we start moving past 10,000 uh, dense dynamic data clouds, we'll be able to identify early transition points uh, for a number of people that will transition in cancers, which is already happening, as well as neurodegenerative disease, which we expect uh, will also happen. Uh, we can use, as I mentioned before, just this genetic risk of disease uh, along with the dense dynamic data clouds to understand how that disease risk manifests. That should be a pathway to early interventions uh, to understand early events in neurodegenerative disease and cancer. Uh, we've already seen that very beautifully, I think, in Huntington's in the mouse models and so forth. But this amount of dense data in the blood should give us more in, uh, insights into that kind of thing for um, human diseases. Uh, we can get uh, more insight, I would say, into driving networks uh, via uh, being able to look at these um, uh, networks that uh, are being built and are getting better all the time because of the great work across the, the community. And that, of course, can give us uh, better drug targets. So uh, with that, let me just, uh, I think I thanked uh, most everyone along the way. But if not, I uh, just thank uh, various people uh, involved in this work. Corey Funk, who did a lot of the work for uh, Trina. Uh, Seth Ahmed, who did a lot of work for Trina and, and HD. Um, uh, Andrew Magis, uh, who's now at Aravale, who, is the, um, uh, who did a lot of the work for the Pioneer 100 uh, study, along with John Earls. Jocelyn Pearl, who did all the HD work uh, that I showed today. Uh, Paul Shannon, who did a lot of work on, um, on Trina, as did Roy Donovan, who's actually now here at the, uh, at the Allen Institute. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. So, um, yeah. I'll chat. <laughs> so, how easy do you think it would be to change people's behavior? Because we all know that we, we know we shouldn't eat too much this, and we shouldn't smoke, and we shouldn't, and then people, and sometimes people, you give them a bad genetic result and say, you're at risk of this, and say, what the hell, I might as well carry on doing it, because I'm already at risk of it. Uh, or somebody who's not told or not risk of it goes back and does the bad behavior or the adverse behavior. How do you think it's going to work out? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's a great point. And I usually talk about that quite a lot. Today I was trying to jump 
you know, through a few things. So when I talk about the scientific wellness, when we did the Pioneer 100, one thing I didn't mention today, which I usually would, is uh, we had a wellness coach that was associated with everyone. So that you take that actionable information, there's a personal relationship between them and a coach to work on behavior. When I mentioned that 170 people we have working over at Aravale, for example, probably 50 of them are behavioral coaches. Uh, so that's a very big element to what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, we could talk a lot more about that. Uh, in terms of engagement, I think that uh, having the, uh, the data is uh, useful but not sufficient, for sure. A personal relationship with someone is definitely helpful. Trying to understand also the social environments and kind of what are the cues, I think that's also important. Because changing human behavior is, as you know, very challenging. Um, so we have huge efforts actually around that. And then the other element, though, that I also hope in parallel is that as we start to have a molecular understanding of these things in more and more detail, hopefully you will be able to develop preventives in you know, more passive kind of ways that help to mimic some of those really good behavioral decisions and so forth. That's been, of course, very challenging to do because of the complexity. But so I think there's a lot we can do on behavior. And then a, on a parallel track, I'm hoping that we can do more in terms of making um, molecular interventions better and better mimic the huge impact you can get from behavior. And safer, because if you're going to persuade somebody to do something for decades, then you improve their health. It's got to be something that's incredibly non-toxic. Incredibly non-toxic, that's right. Yeah. Well, and you, and you would have integrated monitoring all the time, too. So yeah. you can really monitor for, t we actually think we're going to learn a ton about drug toxicities that aren't known today. That's another thing we think we'll learn a ton about. That was a very lovely presentation and that oh, particularly interesting information about the bees there. So you started your presentation by saying how expensive it is, um, just the health care costs as, as they stand currently. What do you put the annual cost for each? So for an individual, were they to want to pay for the sorts of extensive studies that you're doing on them? What's that individual cost? Right. So if someone comes into Aravale, for example, it's uh, $3,500 for the first year. And then it's between 1000 and 1500 for subsequent years. There is one really low cost for $600 if they don't want to do all the testing. Um, that is, I have to admit, a little bit below cost <laughs> at the moment. I mean, that's somewhat subsidized by VCs. Uh, but not by a lot. And that number is coming down. The first year's mo uh, a lot of the expense of the first year is whole genome sequencing. Um, and so you know, there are ways that that could come down, right? You could do a SNP chip or something like that instead. But that's roughly what it costs today to do all the kind of things that I, I, talk, that I touched on a little bit. Um, those costs are declining, which I think is important. Uh, and, then, uh, and then that is a big part of what we're going to do with the Providence study is really look at economic impact. One of the things I've argued at Providence is that if you can do that anywhere close to break even uh, in terms of th Basically, what you've done is you've just gotten a cost reduction on jumping the, your healthcare system to the lead in terms of having a huge amount of data to drive precision medicine of the future. And you do it at a discount because of all the health savings that you get by harnessing value out of that data to help improve people's health and avoid um, disease. And I didn't get into, you know, today I didn't really talk about disease avoidance, but there, um, in the practical, but there's a number of cases where that works really nicely. Uh, and so that economic analysis is going to be really key. And obviously, you haven't been doing this for, for a very long time, but you know, once you have more data behind you, you could actually start to identify which tests would be key at which time frames, at what intervals. Because right now, you know, when you hit 50, you get the, the standard column screen and this sort of thing. Presumably, out of this, you'll start to get data which indicates that you won't have to do the full spectrum on an annual basis, but there would be certain key things that you want to pick up on annually, and then maybe every five years you'd want to do this test. That's exactly right. In fact, in one of the things that we've been doing, or I should say that aravel has been doing to um, like bring down costs on that front is exactly what you're talking about. Like you, fit, you find out, because as we measure all these things from people, you find that there are certain things that you don't really need to measure over and over again. They don't change all that often. Uh, there are others you find that you really want to have more fine tuning. Uh, and we're also, uh, Rory Donovan was working on this when he was uh, still in my group before he moved here. Uh, but one of the things we're doing is building out predictive models where you predict every single analyte from other analytes, uh, you know, kind of a big Bayesian network kind of thing, although it's a little bit different than that. Uh, but basically, uh, what you can do in that scenario is you can start to have a hierarchical network of, you know, you measure these things, and then if something is wrong here, then it triggers it down. So you can bring down costs that way by having more tailored um, predictions. The other interesting thing is that it's really good for determining when you have a real signal or not. So if you know, say, if you've got, you know, metabolite A and it's got the things that are connected to it in that predictive network, 
if, it, if you have a measurement, someone comes in and it's like it jumps way high, you can look at all the things that are related to it or correlated to it, associated with it, right? Because if none of them change, that's probably just a bogus measurement, right? Which happens every once in a while. But if, if it seems to pull on the network it's connected to, then that makes you think, wow, something is really transitioned. It happens. So there's all kinds of ways we can get into that in interesting ways. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to...